Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm Susan James, Assistant Director here at Bayless, and welcome. I want to thank Helen Frost for coming, speaking to us tonight, and for the afternoon workshop, which really went well. And thank you to Janice Repka and Lake Superior State University for including us and giving us this opportunity to host Helen. Thank you also to Barnes & Noble College Bookstore from LSSU. They're out in the lobby and they're offering Helen's books for purchase and Helen would be glad to sign them. Um, I want to thank the Friends of the Library too for the refreshments and the Library's Program Committee for their help in organizing this. Debbie Lehman is at the back, Maggie Johnson and Ashley Fonger are working tonight in the library, as well as Nancy Gillette from the Friends. Helen Frost has written numerous award-winning books for children and young adults, including Keisha's House, which earned a Prince honor, Diamond Willow, which has won various poetry awards, including the 2008 Michigan Library Association Mitten Award, Hidden, a 2012 American Library Association Noble Book, and the picture book, Step Gently Out, that was a popular choice for a Caldecott Award this year. She's the author of a book on creative writing, When I Whisper, Nobody Listens, helping young people write about difficult issues, as well as the author of nonfiction titles for early readers and several poetry books for adults. She has a degree in elementary education from Syracuse University and a master's in English from Indiana University. She's the recipient of a 2009 National Endowment for the Arts Poetry Fellowship. Tonight, Helen will speak about writing for young audiences. Please welcome Helen Frost. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you all, everyone who's here from the library to help um, just enhance this evening, this, the Friends of the Library provided refreshments. And um, I want to mention Janice Repka from the university who has organized the whole event. And it's really been a pleasure to spend two days in your community. And I, I've met a few of you before, and it's nice to see the same faces again. I'm trying not to repeat myself too much. I gave a presentation yesterday that was focused on writing about place. So I was trying to, you know, give some thoughts about how to create a, a setting that's realistic or how to live in a place and then write from that, you know, imagining yourself in that landscape when you are writing. And then last night I gave a reading that was not so much focused on writing for children and young adults, so I read from my po poetry for adults as well as reading some work from the books that I'll be reading from tonight. And I, I won't be reading the same things that I've read before, but I might be reading from the same books. So if, if you're lucky, you might get two or three from the same book enough to entice you to read the whole thing. Um, so tonight, I've been asked to to speak about and to read from work for children and young adults. And I, especially in an audience this size, I feel really comfortable just having it be a conversation to some extent that we can talk and you can tell me who you are and why you're here, what you are hoping to learn from me. And if I can help with that, I'll be happy to. I also brought all my books with you know, poems marked that I could read to you from my books. Sometimes if I have read an author's work, I really love hearing the work in that author's voice. So we'll, it'll be kind of a combination of a reading and a conversation. Um, maybe I'll start with reading two or three poems you know, from some of my different books for children and young adults and tell you a little bit about the story behind the, the story and what brought me to write those books. And then we'll open it up for questions, conversation, comments, whatever you'd like. Um, so yeah, Keisha's House, this, I'll show you both covers of Keisha's House, just so you can see how different they are. This was the hard cover and the first paperback they did. And then this paperback has just come out. So you see how different they are? It's going to be really interesting to me to see how this cover is received and what perceptions kids have of it. I already am hearing, you know, when some kids have seen this cover, they react to the fact that Keisha is portrayed, you know, you can see what race she is, and kids, some kids will say, Keisha's black? You know, really surprised, and other kids will say, you know, I told you Keisha was black, 
And so it's apparently among teenagers who read this book, uh, most of the ones I meet are in classrooms, so they've, they've had some conversation. And apparently that's a question that comes up in their conversations. Um, so I'll read a poem in the voice of Dante. He is a foster, foster child who is in a sort of a suburban foster home that he's not too enthusiastic about. And this is him describing how he feels about being in that home. I did mention this poem last night when I was saying that I had a, um, I, when I was writing Keisha's House, I had young people help me get the voice right, the voices. It's a, this book is written in seven different voices. The house that these kids gravitate towards is a safe place. It's not a um, traditional foster home, you know, formal. The, the guy that owns the house isn't, a, you know, he's, he doesn't have the authority to be a foster father. He's just a kind of a generous person. Um, I am aware that you don't want to encourage teenagers to just go live in a house with some guy, you know, and I tried to create this Joe as a neutral character who is not solving all the problems for the teenagers, but it's a, he offers a place that is safe. Um, we could talk more about that if you want to, you know, if you're interested. Um, I just thought I'd put that out there that I kind of know what I'm doing in this book and I gave that some thought. So here's Dante, how I see it. They'll be saying I ran off, but that ain't how I see it. To me, I went to Carmen's house where all my friends chill out, and when I called home for a ride, my foster dad said, you got there on your own, son, you should be able to get home. They call me son like that, but if I was, they'd run out in that fancy car and give me a ride when I need one. It ain't no home to me. It looked like one, sitting on that green lawn out in the suburbs. My caseworkers say, this house has everything. Four bedrooms, three baths, the house of your dreams. Sound like she's selling it. Their real son has a bathroom to his self and a sign that says, keep out on his door. He got the whole crib on lock, running the whole show. But me, I feel like I'm begging if I ask for a ride. I have to ask if I can eat. I got a ride home last Thursday and when I went in, the house was quiet. They was all done eating, nothing left for me. My foster mom said, sorry son, you need to learn. If you want to run around with those kids and stay out past supper time, you can't expect us to go out of our way to feed you. Where they live, you need a ride to go get food. You can't just run to the corner for a sandwich or go to a friend's house and eat with them. Carmen's grandmama call me son too sometimes, but if I'm hungry at their house, she'll feed me. So now I don't know what to do. It's gonna look like me messing up again. But to me, they locked me out. If I had my own key like their son, I could have got in last night when I finally got a ride from Carmen. It was midnight and the house was dark. Carmen thought I'd gone inside. I tried to run and catch her, but she didn't see me standing out there in the dark street. No house, no food, no ride. I didn't run off. I shivered in the backyard, waiting for the sun. So then the, the next poem in the book, which I'm not going to read, is in Carmen's voice, and she's talking about how she gave her friend a ride home, and she got stopped for driving, and, you know, under the influence she had, you know, she's very defensive about it, but um, she doesn't have her license, and she's had had a beer a couple of hours before, so you know she ends up in a juvenile detention facility, and so part of you know several of Carmen's poems then are written from inside there as she's doing some soul searching. So on the back of this version of the paperback, it tells it just defines each character in a sentence or two. Um, so yeah, I think that helps kids as they're reading it kind of keep track of who's who. But as I see it, these um, seven characters each represent some kind of a question or an issue that uh, teenagers might be trying to figure out. You know, you're trying to, when you're a teenager, if you think of what you're doing, what's the project of your teen years? You know, you have to figure out your vocation, you have to figure out a relationship, maybe with a life partner, you have to figure out um, how to become independent from your parents and how to still, as you become independent, to keep 
a respectful relationship with your parents if, if that's possible and if not to become independent on your own um, creating your own identity so sometimes when I'm talking about this book to teenagers they ask me which of these seven characters is most like you and I, I do sort of have an answer to that you know I, I can choose one that's probably more like me than some of the others but really I think I identify in a different way with each of them and when they say you know did, all those, did any of those things that happened in Keisha's house happen to you when you were a teenager I'm sort of fond of saying that everything that happened in that book happened to me and that sometimes elicits kind of gasps of surprise because you know I, I have to explain then that no you know I did not get pregnant when I was 16 and I didn't you know I wasn't kicked out of my house by my parents but I did have think questions about my own life that I had to resolve that you know I might have had a different sense of what I wanted to do with my life than my parents had for me and I had to figure that out for myself so the emotional center of each character it, it you know the, the central emotional question was something that I did face growing up and I think everybody does you know we all go through these things as teenagers so um, I don't think I'll, I'll read just maybe a little bit from um, maybe two more books and then we'll pause and we can have conversation for a while and I can read more in a little bit later on this is a book that I don't know this, uh, this um, event is called writing for children and young adults and I, so I want to focus on both children and young adults this was the second book that I wrote um, if, if with this publisher and this um, the, a novel in poems that format and um, this is a book about a classroom of fifth graders. It's called Room 214, which to me represents a, a room based on love, centered on love, Valentine's Day is 214. So that's how I came up with that name. So each character has two or more poems in the book and the, they're written in different formal structures. Um, so this is Ryan's first poem and the title of the poem is Suki. And you'll hear a really different um, sort of level of engagement maybe um, that, that you can tell that I'm writing for younger children in this book in this these poems the poems are a little simpler partly the reading level is probably simpler and the emotional things they go through aren't easy but they're not of this level of complexity of the stories in Keisha's house and they're not developed to that degree either so this is called Suki Suki's gone, our cat. I looked in the hall closet, the cellar, nowhere. We've had her almost three years. She wouldn't just leave, would she? Three days, I won't cry. Her bed empty by the door, all our rooms quiet. Who would think one missing cat could make a whole house silent? And this is Richard. Pepperoni was my dog. I know how Ryan feels. Suki, his white cat, she's missing. He wants me to help him look, but I don't know his cat. I don't know where Suki sleeps or what she eats. In other words, Suki isn't Pepperoni. Pepperoni was my dog. He died. Now, every day when I come home from school, Pepperoni doesn't thump his tail. Pepperoni doesn't curl beside me on the couch. Even if I whistle and pat the place he likes, rawhide bones and chewed up toys aren't left all over the backyard. My ears are empty from the noises pepperoni doesn't make. I know how much space one dog or cat can fill. And then this is Ryan again. She came home, she ate and left again. I followed, she's under the porch. You can hear something in there. Suki lies down, curls up, purr. Four kittens, two white like Suki, one gray and brown, one black as midnight. You have to lift a loose board to see them. Careful, don't touch. Midnight, small white star above his right eye. Suki lets me pick him up. I hold his fur to my cheek. His heart beats against my skin. 
And then one more in that series. This is Manuel. It's called One Small Kitten. Now what do we want with a cat? That's all my mama got to say. She won't listen. I tell her that it's just a kitten, brown and gray. Ryan says I can have it when it's big enough to give away. Mama says, no. I say again, just a small kitten, brown and gray. I know a good place to keep it, a box in the downstairs hallway. I measured and the box will fit my soft-eyed kitten, brown and gray. You got four sisters, there's enough mouths to feed. Now who's going to pay for cat food? But it won't eat much, just one kitten. It's brown and gray and it likes me. It licks my hand with its sandpaper tongue. Someday I'll have a big house, just me and my own kitten, soft, brown and gray. Later on in the book, there's a poem about um, Manuel and one of his sisters and that the, in the, the second section of the book, I take one line from the poems in the first section and use that as an acrostic. I write those words down the side and use those letters as the beginning of each line. And so there's a poem where uh, that I use the word enough mouths to feed. And it emerges that Manu one of Manuel's sisters is, has cerebral palsy and it's quite an effort to feed her. And Manuel is trying to figure out how to make a, how to give her a birthday cake where she can blow out the candles herself and somebody asked me i think it was yesterday if or maybe it was this afternoon if any of the poems in my books are based on real kids and so that was a situation where it was um that i i uh, not exactly the same but i knew a family where the um the younger daughter was concerned about her older brother who couldn't blow out his birthday candles. He had cerebral palsy. And they actually went to a place uh, where people, scientists were working on developing ways of helping children with disabilities. And the kids came up with this idea of putting a board with a hair dryer on it and so that the boy could like hit the board and then turn on the hair dryer and blow out the candles. And it actually worked. And I just, I love that so much. I said, could I use that in a book? And they were like, of course, you know? <laughs> so that's the kind of thing where you, you might hear something and you just think, it's, you know, it's so great. And I always ask permission, or generally, you know, if I possibly can. You know? But I just wanted to give you some sense of the relationship between real life and my books. Um, so let's pause for a minute and just we'll, I'll do this throughout the reading. Um, what kinds of questions do you have? What do you wonder about, about my writing or about your writing or the world of children's literature? What do you want to know? How did you break in? Yeah, she asked me this earlier and I, I said I didn't save it for this exactly, but I just said other people might want to know too. So if you have a children's book that you've written, how do you get it published? How do you like break into the market? And I, I did answer briefly to just say um, it's it's not easy. It's it's very difficult. But you know, I stand here to say it's not impossible either. You know, and like anything, you you know, it's, it, I wouldn't say, you know, if you just want something bad enough and you keep working until you know you'll you'll get it. You know, just keep working hard until you get what you want. It's not that easy. You know, it's like. You keep working hard, not having any idea if you will ever break in and, and get a book published. You know, it's really hard. Um, so I had been writing for, uh, I spent about 20 years learning to write poetry and sending thing, individual poems off to magazines, no comp monetary compensation at all. You know, you just, as a poet, you do not expect to earn a living writing poetry. You know, it doesn't happen. Um, and then I had a book of poetry published for adults, and then about, I kept writing both, you know, for, for a long time I was writing prose for children and poetry for adults, and then when I, the breakthrough for me came when I realized that I knew two different things. I knew a lot about children's literature, and I knew a lot about poetry, and I started writing the Keisha's House poems in the voices of teenagers, and that became a novel, you know, I, and I, at, when I finished it, I'm like, oh, you know, I wrote a novel. It wasn't like I even really set out to do that, but it, that's how it developed. And I sent that out, 
I don't know, three or four or five times. One time I entered it in a, com a competition for, it's this organization called SCBWI, and if you write for children, you'll learn to know that it's an organization for children's writers. And it was a work in progress contest, and it, it didn't win. I think it got an honorable mention, but about a month after the um, results were announced, I got a letter from an editor in New York, and she said, I've read your manuscript in progress, and I, I would like to, when it's finished, I'd like to see it. Well, that was like gold, you know, I was holding this letter, I was so ecstatic, you know, this is so awesome. And then, um, so I really polished it. It was already pretty polished when I sent it off to that contest. And I worked really hard, and I sent it to her, and then, you know, a month later, I get this little thin envelope saying, sorry, you know, it's not for me. And I, I still remember that day, just like going into a bookstore in Fort Wayne where I live, and just like looking around at all these books on the shelf and kind of like, who are all these people? You know, just like, it was just frustrating to have felt like, you know, somebody even who asked to see it then turned it down. You know, that was just a low point. Um, so then I thought, well, where would I really like to have my book published? And I thought there's a, a publisher that's very well known for literary fiction and poetry, Farrar Strauss and Giroux, and they also have a division for children. So I thought maybe they like literary books for kids. You know, that was just my reasoning. And I don't think I had even done what I always tell everybody else to do, which is read a lot of books that are published, you know, pay attention to who's publishing what. And when you see a publisher that's publishing not exactly the same as you, but you know something that you think might be compatible, that might be a good place to send your work. So I called a friend and asked her to suggest an editor at Farrar Strauss and Giroux, and she suggested Frances Foster, who then and they always say, um, at least at that time, the ten years ago, they were saying to let an editor have something for three months and if you don't hear then it's okay to send it out or to let them know that you're doing that or something so anyway i sent a cover i think i worked longer on the cover letter than i had i really wanted to make a connection i wanted her to know that it wasn't just random you know that i had selected her and that i admired some of the other books she had published she had re recently published holes that was a book that i think is just wonderful i love and I, i've since learned more people that she has published Anyway, so three months later, just about the time that I had given her, she called me on the phone and she told me she loved my book and she wanted to publish it. So, you know, that was probably, you, you know, you just like go, wow, you know, that like it happened, it, it you know, this, this wonderful thing happened. And what I didn't realize at the time is that she was really taking me on as an author. You know, she was publishing my book, but ever since then, she has been my editor. Um, so, so all these novels in poems, I've worked with Frances Foster on, and it's a wonderful relationship. She, you know, each each book of mine is so different, and she really knows how. I think she has a lot of different authors that I have a lot of respect for, and she knows how to kind of bring the best from each author, and then with each author, she must at least with me, she really knows what each book is kind of trying to become, and she'll read a manuscript and. Mostly, she you know says she loves it, and she you know has a few questions and a few tweaks, and just once she has <coughs> not loved something that I wrote, and I had I realized I had a lot more work to do on that book, and it, it did eventually get published, but you know it's a, it's that's a long road, so I don't know how much that helps you know to just say what my journey was. My journey was you know, work really, really hard for 30 years and then get lucky. You know, that's kind of how it worked for me. And uh, these days, there are a lot of temptations, I think, as I see it as temptations, um, to self-publish or to, you know, do something with Amazon which isn't as stringent in terms of what they'll accept and so forth. So I know a lot of people doing that. I'm not opposed to it, but I'm, I'm still cautious about it. You know, I wonder, as for a new author breaking in, I'm not sure if self-publishing is a good way to break into a field. Because for me, I think, you know, waiting until I found an editor who 
you know, really loved my work enough to take it on, it was worth the wait. You know, the trouble is, while you're doing that wait, you don't know if it's worth it or not. You don't know what's going to happen. So it's really hard to, you know, I, I mean, I'm just supportive of whatever path anybody takes along the way. One thing that not everybody knows is that um, when you have a, a manuscript that you think would be a good picture book, you, you don't find your own illustrator. You have to get your text accepted by a publisher, and then they find an illustrator for it. Um, and I still have several picture book manuscripts that I'm sending around, and even you know, with all these books published and two picture books that have done well, it still is not that easy. To I, I have some books that I think would make great picture books. I can picture the illustrators that I would love, and it's you know, I even have an agent now. I didn't for my first five books. I didn't have an agent. Now I have an agent, and she sends things out for me, but. It's it's not magic, you know. It's not like once you get one book published, you can publish anything you want, you know. So I don't know. Does that help at all? Well, see, I yeah. hear key things that you're saying, and they're like, you need an editor, and and when you you first write, you actually do make a manuscript. You're saying more. Um, uh -huh. It's not, you know. I mean, like, I wouldn't even. I kind of don't even know where to start in the sense okay. of doing a manuscript. I mean, right. I guess. Right. You know, the so, yeah, that's, uh, uh, thank you for clarifying that because I, I do start talking and there's a lot of lingo, right. you know, that I just, you hardly even realize. Well, I've like, seen, you know, sample manuscripts, I guess, and, and stuff, but well, I don't even know this, the process. And yeah, I that's really, else does, but. and you don't maybe know what a cover letter is or right. what you write in a cover letter. So, I'm going to say again this organization, if you're writing for children, the, it's, uh, the whole thing is the Society of Children's book writers and illustrators. And if you can remember S, C, B, W, I, and look that up online, okay. they have multiple resources. Even for non-members, there are a lot of resources on that. And actually, if you look at my website, I have a page on my website that's resources for writers. I think that's what it's called. And I have links to that website and to um, there's a, a couple of other places that just get you started in learning, you know, about writing for children. <coughs> but I would really recommend if you're if you're serious about writing for children, find your local chapter of SCBWI and join. It's, I don't know what it costs now, sixty or seventy dollars a year or something. Then you'll have the full membership on the website. You get the magazine, and you just once you start meeting other people who are writing, you, you it's just over the course of I'm, I wouldn't be impatient about it, but over the course of five or six years, that's what I what usually happens. If people come, like if, I have a group in Fort Wayne, if people come to our meeting, they usually like have something they've already written and they want to come, they come wanting to know how to publish it, and you know we invite them in, we do critiques, we make suggestions for the manuscript. This is, before you have an editor, your best friends are your friends. You know, other people who are doing what you're doing, going to conferences and workshops, and if you want to do an MFA, there's some low residency programs where you can kind of really jumpstart a career. But basically what most people do is learn from each other and find, I mean, things like this, you're here, you know, that you're learning. Um, there's a book called, uh, something like, I think it's by Harold Underdown, but I should, I'm self-conscious about this um, video camera because I could be wrong. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's, there's a, something, it was one of the Complete Idiot books, I think, like Children's Writing for the Complete Idiot or something. It's either that or, what's the other one? There's the Complete Idiot and then there's the, dummies. the dummies, yeah. So I don't know if, it's, if you have to be a dummy or an idiot, but um, <laughs> anyway, if, if you're just beginning, it, you know, get a book like that that just basically lays it out, like, what, what, how do you present a manuscript? What, how do you know if it's a picture book or an early reader or a chapter book? And as you're, be, you know, you're learning to write, at the same time you're learning all those mechanics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, there's a lot to learn and you can learn it. You know, it's all learnable. I think a tricky thing these days is how fast everything's changing. You know, with e-books and the, public, the publishers are merging, and it's really, well, you know, 10 years ago, I could keep track of which editor was at which house, and now I, I still do, but it's hard, you know. 
um, to j just pay attention to who's moving from one house to another and so forth and who's publishing what and um, there's there's also an industry newsletter which I'm not sure it's a good idea when you're just starting out because it's it's full of like success stories of other people and it can make you feel bad it can like be, you know you can think like oh that's just like the same idea I had like three years ago and now they've done it I can't do it or or it can you know you'll hear about somebody selling three books in one you know one deal and it'll tell you who their agent is or something and but anyway that if you're interested um, it's publishers weekly um, it's a a weekly online newsletter that comes out for anyone interested in children's books. Um, it's, it's kind of the same process if you weren't just doing a children's book, right? It's what? Like kind of the same process for any types of books that you write? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, my experience of getting published is in children's and YA, you know. I mean, I've, I've also published some poetry books in really small presses that's completely different story but it's the same kind of patience that's required you know you have to you have to what some people I think I think some people think that if you just have the magic key to how to get published then you'll get published and really the magic key is in being a really good writer you know so I can remember um, I think I was working on Keisha's house or I hadn't been published yet, and I was reading the Newberry winner, which was Bud, Not Buddy. And my husband came home from work, and I was just saying, ah, this is so discouraging. You know, I'll just never be able to write a book like this. It's just so good. You know, I was so admiring of it. And he goes, Helen, it's the Newberry. You know, kind of like, take it easy on yourself in that way. And now I look back on that, and I think, that's actually really good that I recognized that this book was better than what I could write. You know, I just I could see what was so good about it, and it kind of gives you a certain kind of ambition or something. Not not like ambition to win the Newberry, but ambition to just like be the best writer you can be. So it's not like I want to be Christopher Paul Curtis either. It's I want to be whoever I am and to you know write the best book I can write. So you know, you have your own book, and if you can just learn whatever you can learn about writing from whatever way you can learn it and keep keep being willing to take feedback on it and to learn from each other you know have writers groups or whatever yeah uh, now you mentioned um, taking classes and seminars and such yeah um, but if you have a manuscript is that you think that there's any utility in um, hiring an editor to help you polish it? Do you think that that would be just a waste of money? Or? No, I don't think that's a waste of money. There's <laughs> what I recommend if you're in that situation is um, an organization called Namelos, N-A-M-E-L-O-S. And it's um, Stephen Roxburgh, R-O-X-B-U-R-G-H was Roald Dahl's editor and he worked at for FSG for you know he was the, I think the senior editor at FSG for many years he's worked with a lot of outstanding authors Carolyn Coleman is his wife she's also a wonderful author and Stephen was her editor that was how they met actually which is interesting um, but if you look that up online N-A-M-E-L-O-S they have a service where they will I think they'll read something like 10,000 words and give you a critique of that 10,000 words for maybe $250 or something like that, which is reasonable, you know, if you're given that level of expertise. And so it's, it's Stephen and, and three or four other people. But if you, if what, what I think people have gained from that is learning, he, he's very honest with you about whether your manus what he sees of, of that first 10,000 words is um, if, he, if he thinks that's something that is ready to send out to publishers he'll g give you some critique and then let you know that and if he thinks that you have more to learn before you're ready to do that he'll let you know that so it's I think it's really useful I have a friend who used that that service and then the other nice thing is that um, if you work with them and and I don't even like to hold this out as I, I don't want someone to do this because they hope this will happen because it doesn't happen very often but if they work with you on a manuscript they can publish it 
they have a print on demand publisher. You know, he's, he used to work for um, Boyd Smith. He's, he's worked for a lot of different, he's um, worked with a lot of different really good authors at different houses. So he definitely knows the business and knows what he's doing as an editor. Um, but he's, he, I think, got weary of the um, business aspect of publishing, of sending out a lot of books two bookstores and then having them come back as returns and all the wear and tear on the books and just the, the physical objects of books, um, which I love and many people love, but I can't imagine that it's kind of a headache for a publisher to keep track of all those. And so he does e-books most, well not only e-books, he does e-books and print on demand, yeah. But anyway, that's, um, and then there are probably other people you could hire just if you need, do you, do you know that there are like different kinds of editors? Like this, uh, what we, like Frances Foster, who I mentioned earlier, is my main editor, and she does what I call substantive editing. In other words, you know, the motivation of the characters, or the relationship of the people to the place, or you know, does this does the pace of the story hold up? Is there a place where it sags in the middle? Um, does it begin at the beginning, or should there, should we have more or less before we really get into the story? Um, that kind of question. So she works with me as I'm really developing the story, and then after that, it goes back and forth several times with the copy editors, and they're the ones that do, like you know, is this character who was named Jimmy in chapter three still named Jimmy in chapter ten, or you know, sometimes you might make a change like that and not get all with, you know, find and. Re what is it called? Find and replace. Replace. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't find that word. Find and replace. That's not so likely to happen, but they can. You know. Um, so and they do punctuation and and little detail. But I'm always every book I write, I'm amazed at things that I would think I would know that the copy editors find. You know, they'll they'll notice things like if you use the same expression like on one page and then use that expression again on the next page. You might not see it, but they'll say, do you want to change one of these? And it's always up to me. You know, nobody, they never, nobody ever makes me change something that I don't agree with. But I'm usually convinced, you know, partly just out of huge respect for all they know and what I've seen them do, you know. So, and, they, and even the copy editors, send it out to proofreaders, you know, so it, it goes, it's proofread, it's copy edited, and it, there's so many back and forth passes before it's done. So yeah, I think if you are going to um, self-publish or if you even, if you want to send something off to, a, to an editor, if you're not really confident in your own, you know, your own ability with the mechanics and the, if, it, it wouldn't hurt to hire an editor. Or like I said, find a good friend, you know, find a respected other, another author who is working at the same level you are or maybe a little beyond where you are and who is willing to help you. A lot of you are taking classes, that's the same, that's awesome, you know. So we've kind of been talking around the same type of things, but what are some other questions that people might have? I find it really interesting that you write poetry for children and young people because maybe it's just my age, but I don't remember reading poems of that type when mm -hmm. I was young. Mm -hmm. um, it was more like Longfellow and right, you know, epic poems and things like that. Mm -hmm. But nothing that really spoke to you as a child. Yeah, were your poems? Yeah. I really, I mean, uh, that is something that I think is happening more and more now. That there, well, there are all different kinds of of poet. You know, different people are writing different kinds of poetry for children. So there's, you know, like Shel Silverstein or someone who is kind of fun and delightful. You know, but uh, and and does write for children. You know, to where children are, he makes them, you know, laugh and think and so forth. And then there's a poet like Joyce Sidman, who I love. She writes really um, beautiful poetry. A lot of it is about nature, but just beautiful poetry. And a lot of her books are illustrated with gorgeous illustrations. And so she, I think, 
is another person who's taking children seriously and, and writing you know, the best poetry she can about things that she thinks children will be interested in. Um, Marilyn Nelson is someone who's a very well-respected poet for adults who also writes for children and young adults, and she, I love her work. She, have, you, have any of you ever seen a book called A Wreath for Emmett Till? Do you know who Emmett Till was? was um, he was a, a young, I think, 14-year-old black teenager who was killed in, I think it was Mississippi, probably around 1955. I'm, I might be fuzzy on my details, but anyway, it was a, a really big event in the live, I, 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 I think I remember it, although I'm not sure I remember it from when I was a child, but it, Marilyn's book really makes you feel what it must have been like to be, you know, live, uh, to be black at that time in 1955 and to experience what happened to that young man. And she just writes, it's a, a beautiful, formally structured um, crown of sonnets, 14, 15 poems long with a really tight formal structure and just passionate and beautiful. That's, I'm just like kind of going on about it because that came to my mind about there are all different kinds of poets writing for children. You know, you'll have people writing kind of fun, po fun poems, historical poems, people that will take, you know, one idea maybe about animals or something and gather an anthology of books about animals. Um, Marianne Hoberman is another poet that she, has been writing for many years. She's um, really meticulous about rhyme and rhythm and, and just the sound of her poems. I remember a picture book that she wrote when my son was young, so you know, 20 some years ago. It was A House is a House for Me, and it was like, you know, all these different images of something being a house for something else, and, and it just letting her imagination go with that. Um, but I do, I do think that what I'm doing is different than what people did when I was a child. You know, I think that when we were children, it was more, like you say, um, you know, simple stories in rhyme and rhythm. And I think people are being more experimental now, both for children and for young adults. There's a lot of different things. No, but um, when you were starting to learn the craft of poetry, um, who influenced or inspired you? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if they were contemporaries at the time or classic poets or? Well, um, when I, I went to Syracuse University in the late 60s and early 70s and I had W.D. Snodgrass for a teacher and Philip Booth was one of my teachers. And then in the years since then, I had um, workshops with William Stafford. It's interesting that, just a second. Let me get a drink. <laughs> it's interesting that all my early teachers were men, but th I was also very influenced by the, the sort of feminist movement in poetry, that I loved Muriel Ruckheiser and Elizabeth Bishop. She, I wouldn't call Elizabeth Bishop a feminist, but she was you know, a woman poet that was very well respected. And then um, there were just, I would say that there was a certain group of women writing around the time that I was just beginning to write. Denise Levertov was someone that I loved. And now there are you know, hundreds of women poets. It's just, if you look at an anthology or the, you know, the list of the chancellors at the Academy of American Poets, it's you know, easily half women in most things. But I, can, I really remember like in the late 60s, early 70s, looking at an anthology of you know, 100 poets and finding four or five women, you know, that was quite typical. So I feel like I've been really lucky to be coming of age in a field that's opening up and uh, open to women. So both in poetry and in writing for children, I think, you know, my timing of entering into the field was probably fortunate, you know, like that, yeah. So there are so many poets that influenced me, and definitely my contemporaries, you know, people who are, you know, around my same age that have just been friends all my life. I, I have, um, and so, some of the people who were graduate students at Syracuse when I was an undergraduate, 
that I really admired. Hi, come on in and don't be shy. This is Janice Repka, by the way, who has organized this whole event, and um, her daughter, nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, so, where was that? Um, Talking about the graduates. Yeah, so, so when I was like 21, I thought someone who was 28 was like really old and wise, and I, you know, listened to every word that they said, and you know, I, I look back at that and kind of chuckle now, because you know, like 28-year-olds are like my kids, you know, and they're friends, and but that's a, you know, it's a substantial thing that you do in your 20s, you know, that growing up decade, I think. So anyway, um, a couple of the people that were my teachers when I was an undergraduate were graduate students who I'm still friends with. And that's a cool thing, you know? So. I think the relationships in poetry and in children's writing, in children, writing for children, both of the, you know, writing, relationships among writers are mostly really um, positive and delightful. You know, they're supportive and helpful. So that's a, you know, I keep saying, you know, know each other and, and work together and keep, you know, even if you're finished taking classes or if you haven't started taking classes yet, um, nurture the relationships that you have among other writers and, you know, find people you trust. And if you find someone that doesn't speak to your writing, if you don't think they understand your writing, keep, keep looking until you find someone who does. Yeah. I had one group of writers who, about, um, I think there were six of us who met at, we, we lived in different parts of Indiana, we were all children's writers, and we met at a central place about four times a year, and we would send each other whatever we were working on in advance about two weeks ahead, then we'd get together and we'd spend, it was, I think it was at a Holiday Inn in Goshen, Indiana, and they just let us come in and use that little breakfast corner and we would just you know go over one person's work at a time and i remember the help i got with my work but even more i remember hearing the names of editors and and you know places who was taking what and and then we said each of us when we started most of us weren't published but over that course of the three or four years that we met together each of us had some kind of success in getting a book published and after a while we all had our own we all had editors and we didn't need each other in the same way that we had and one person and moved out of town, you know, so it kind of, I, I've been in a number of writers groups that have disbanded after a few years, that's fairly typical, I think, but it's still totally worth it to do it for as long as it is helpful. Do you feel motivated to make your work global? To, you know, like, do you feel like it's important for your books to be important to children in Africa? Or yeah, well, you know, the trouble with my, uh, Monarch and Milkweed was translated into Korean, and as far as I know, that's the only one. And I can get a little bit um, envious of other authors whose books are translated into thousands of languages, but really, because, of, because I work in my novels in these formal structures, with you know, some depending on rhyme or syllables, or it, most of my books are really hard to translate. And so I haven't had very much of that happen, and I think it would be fine, but I, you know, it's not, it's not I actually think, you know, uh, even national uh, yeah, attention is kind of more than anyone should expect. Because if you think about, you know, a community, like a community might, in, in olden times, you know, might have had a storyteller, you know, so a group of 100 people might have had someone who was really good at remembering the history of that place and passing on the stories to the next people. So that whole, whole oral tradition was so local. And I've known a number of, you know, really good local storytellers who, who that's what they do. They know the history of their family or their place. And I think really, you know, why would, why would I want to be like a storyteller for the whole of the United States of America? You know, it's, I mean, I think when I think in those terms, I think what actually happens is that we break ourselves into different kinds of communities. So there's a small community of children's poets and people who love children's poetry. And that's maybe like a local, you know, community you used to be or something where, you know, Janice and I were talking about why would young adult literature be a genre, you know, when you're, I mean, it's really an audience, it's an age, and 
why would we expect all teenagers to read the same kind of thing when, you know, then three years later, they're going to be read, and they obviously do when they're teenagers too, but some people like mysteries, and some people like romance novels, and some people like poetry, and some people like historical fiction or nonfiction. You know, there's so many different kinds of writing, and that is as true for young adults as it is for adults. Old adults. I, I mean, it would be funny to have a whole section in the library for people aged, you know, 35 to 50 or something. It's just—it's amusing if you think about it. But I, I say that, although I also understand that teenagers and you know young adults do have particular things that they like to read. Um, I think recent research suggests that over half of the books bought. You know, young adult books that are purchased are bought by adults. Yeah, it's not not all books by teenagers, and probably at least half of the books teenagers read are not young adult books. You know, they're books for adults. Yeah, like the Hunger Games, for example. I've seen the yeah. young adult section, yeah. but I know a lot of adults. Yeah. Yeah. I was in China recently, and I saw her not Hunger Games, but her her recent book for adults. I saw that in Chinese. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Should have, should have taken a picture or even bought it, but I didn't. <laughs> what What's the difference, I guess, when you write? Because your poetry is not just like the typical poetry I learned when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where we did the acoustic poems or, or just, you know, rhyme and, you know, the mm -hmm. stuff I grew up, I was taught. Um, they, they tell more of a story. It's, it's, um, mm -hmm. So what kind of is the difference between your writing like that and writing somebody just writing to a, a young audience I mean what's the the difference in the writing of the poetry as opposed to yeah just I mean I guess I feel like you know what I do is is really particular to me you know it, it combines my interest I mean you know I've always loved children I've always loved poetry I've worked with teenagers extensively and I have found ways of combining everything that is important to me and that I love, and not maybe everything, but you know, all these things. I love travel, and so the, my books are set in different places. And I have found ways of, of bringing these things together in my books. So that's not surprising. You know, my books are what I love. And so your books will be what you love. You know, you were telling me a little bit about that earlier. And there, there's definitely a place for the kinds of books that you're envisioning. And you'll find whether you want to do that as fiction, nonfiction, right. memoir, um, you know, plays. There's just so many different ways of writing poetry, you know. Um, I just wonder that. I guess my question, you know, I'm, I've never considered myself a poet, okay? I mean, you know, you can rhyme, the roses are red. They yeah. Like I just did yeah. for my kids, you know, for a Valentine's Day that I was set up. But, um, you know, why would your, diff your writing be different than mine when I'm not, I don't consider myself a poet? What's the, I mean, I, I, I was looking through the, this book <clears throat> that I have that of yours. Which one is it? Oh, well, and I just started. Diamond Willow? Well, this one's not so much because oh, you're that's, taking, that's more oh, others. And so, but I, and I haven't had a chance to look much at the other, which I'm going to do before yeah. I leave, but I, maybe I'm phrasing it wrong. What? It's not, this, when I skimmed through, it's not um, set up like I'm used to seeing just a, a poem. Yours are telling more of a story. Yeah. The poetry. I mean, is. that's it. I, I have a hard time, like, uh, you know, I, I, I am a poet because I've written poetry mm -hmm. for both adults and teenagers. And I guess I'm a novelist because these books, these long narrative poetry things that I do have, you know, complex story right. and characters and setting and those things that novelists do, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm comfortable calling myself either of those things, but the, the comparison that I make sometimes to writing a novel in poems is like, I don't know, it was just a videotape I saw on YouTube or something of a surfer who just like surfed like for like five minutes. It just was looked so exhilarating, just this really long wave. And I feel like that's kind of what I do. I mean, like if the ocean is poetry and prose is the land, 
I'm kind of somewhere in between there. I'm not exactly swimming and I'm not exactly walking along the sand, but I'm just, I'm doing something else in this in-between land that I just love. You know, it's like I can pull my poetry toolboxes to help me tell a story. I can, you know, tell a story to help my poetry become more, you know, fully developed. And it's just fun for me, you know, so that's, that's just who I am, you know, and so as every writer, I think, has their own journey to find out what is, what you can do best, and what, how do you learn how to do that, you know, you learn from each other, you learn from going to conferences, workshops, you know, all kinds of ways. Is there a central place you can try to find workshops? Um, you know, like, where, if well, you're looking for one, or... Yeah, I mean, if it, I think I would say it depends on how much commitment you want to put into it. Like that SCBWI that I said, to build every regional um, organization in that or group in that organization will have a conference probably once a year. Mm -hmm. So there's, pro I'm sure there's one for Michigan. Um, if you want to do something, you know, a little more expensive and maybe more substantial. Um, the Highlights for Children workshops in, uh, I think it's Honigsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, they, they might have like three or four day workshops where you would go and work with, you know, uh, some, somebody with another a group of people who have been um, selected to be in that workshop. And then if you're serious about writing for children and young adults, um, this, a, a, if you want to do an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts, there's a low residency program at Vermont College that seems to be really good. Another one at Hamlin University in um, Minnesota that has a really good reputation. And I know people who teach and who have gone to both of those programs and really learned a lot. That's a commitment of, I think, five semesters, and you're really working hard. You're, you know, you're sending things. To, they have really good teachers. You're sending packets to those teachers every five or six weeks, and they're giving you feedback. And you know, a lot of people come out of that with something worth publishing. And, and then the editors know that the people working there are working really hard, and so they may come to your graduation or something. And you know, it's that's a, a good way of kind of kick-starting a children's writing career again no guarantees but it's it's a good community I've seen it's good to know I just finished I just graduated my master so yeah when you say that I'm like oh I don't yeah know I, I know. do that yet you I know, know but yeah I know. yeah so I'm just I, what I was trying to do was just give the kind of different levels yeah of, no I, I yeah and the, also in SCBWI most people kind of join it and then go to a couple of regional conferences and then once you have a manuscript or you've been writing for a few years, there's a national conference twice a year that a lot of people go to. Yeah. That's How are we doing on time here? Do we want to stop for refreshments or should we keep talking or do you want to get up and get refreshments and come back and keep talking or do you want me to read some more? Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. But I guess, should I just say, feel free to get up and get something if you want a <laughs> cookie or something. It's amazing, yeah. Okay, well, I love The Braid. I've, I've read a couple of poems from it in a couple of different workshops already. And this is a story about two sisters who were separated in 1850 in the Highland Clearances. So the, the, when people were forced to leave Scotland, one of the sisters came to Nova Scotia and one stayed in Scotland. And um, this is, the poem I'm reading now is in the voice of Jeannie, who went to Nova Scotia, and she's there, at this point in the story, she's there with her mother and her baby brother. And she's looking around at, you know, in, in the island that she came from, there weren't these big trees. And I just, I remember visiting both places and just thinking, how startling that would have been to be someone going to this new place, having lived all your life on you know, the Outer Hebrides and then finding yourself in Nova Scotia. So this is what she's describing. And, and she and her mother are, are poor. The father, I, I, I hate to give things away in case people read the book, but the father and two of the little children died of cholera on the crossing. So she, it's she and her mom and her baby brother, and they didn't expect to be in this situation alone. So they're very poor alone among these giant trees. And it's Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. I see an otter sliding down a muddy riverbank. I'm comforted a bit 
one small familiar face. The sea cliffs here are hidden behind dark forests. I remember Grandma telling of a forest she once heard about, treetops higher than houses. We thought it was a fairy tale. I see now such trees are real. They rise up all around us. My eyes long to rest on a wide and empty sky. These trees say to us, you're small, you're nothing. We have found no home here. Fishing, picking berries, we stay alive, but mother's weak. She still believes we may find our kin. I don't expect to. Your kin may have gone to Australia, one man told us. Our skirts are torn and dirty. We sleep in any shelter we can find. An old barn when it rains, the forest when it's clear. I see tracks of animals, large, unknown to me. I peer into the trees and listen hard. A wolf, an owl, or the wind? I shiver and hold Willie tight. People stare at us. Oh, I miss Sarah. She'd know how to make a home. But I see no way to fetch her, and we cannot return. A wee cove near here is our best source of water. A flat, a flat rock is like a table. We've learned to dig into the sand for clams. Life sometimes feels safe on mornings when the weather's clear. Then, as a storm comes in from a distance, I must gather all my courage. Speaking to strangers is, to me, like eating sand. But we have to ask for shelter and a bit of food. So we trudge along a dirt road, hungry and tired. I look into a farmyard where a farmer tries to shoo a pig and chicken into a pen. Might we have an egg, I ask. Long and hard, he stares at us, at me. My skirt crusted with brown dirt holes in both my shoes. He glances at his chickens. They have all but one escaped. He looks around, then back at us. Where is the baby's father? Tears spring to my eyes. They fall before I stop them, and he holds up one precious egg here and smiles at me. He sees that mother and I are alone and says, come with me, miss. I'll show you where you might look for eggs. Mother takes Willie from me then. We do not like this man. We walk away. We both fall silent. Do you th think, mother, are there words for such a question? Do you think perhaps he thought that I am Willie's mother? My cheeks burn. It did appear that way, she answers. And then, oh, Jeannie, I see great beauty coming to you. She looks intently into my face. Is she complimenting me, warning me? I cannot tell. Thunder, beauty, rumbles in the distance. Home seems farther off than ever. I take one step, one more. <clears throat> I think what I, what I loved about writing this book was that each poem, you know, felt like a poem in itself. Like that, that poem tells a little mini story and then they all together, you know, combined into the larger story. And this one, I think more than meant any of the others, was just that feeling of absolute astonishment at what, was, what language was capable of. I was working with really intent really intently with the formal structure of that book. And I remember, again, my husband coming home one time and kind of saying, what happened? Like, I looked like something happened that day. And, that, like, you know, he was thinking I'd had some traumatic experience or something. I was just like, it was just an amazing day to be writing. You know, it's just, just the writing was happening, you know, and that was really fun. I think it's harder to get those kinds of days anymore because there are so many distractions, you know, mm -hmm. the, all the internet and Facebook. <laughs> it's really hard to just sink into language and, and live there for a few weeks or months and uh, as long as it takes to write a book, you know. So maybe some of you have advice for me about that. <laughs> like, um, let's see. And I think um, I'd like to read, let's see. Maybe this will be the last thing I'll read, and then we could maybe, do you think, break for refreshments and just conversation individually. So this is this book, Hidden, that um, was really hard for me to write. This is the one where I first showed it to my editor, and she was like, uh, you know, what is it? She, it, was, it took us a while, both of us, because I had a big idea 
when I started this book. My idea for this book was that the characters from the Bray, Jeannie and Sarah, you know, having gone their separate ways for six generations, were somehow going to be reconnected. You know, and, and I, had, I had sort of intellectualized probably too much how that might happen. And I had you know, done all these elaborate family trees and, and Diamond Willow and Crossing Stones were both part of that story that I had in my mind. So they, they were related, but I, you know, I, I don't know if I, if I ever will do that aspect of the story. But as I was writing it, the, I had this character, Ren, and she was actually, for the first version of, of the story, she was mute. She did not say a word, and she had this really energetic, active brother who was always overshadowing her. And my editor was like, you know, why is Ren so quiet? You know, when are we going to get to hear her voice? So then I started thinking, what happened to Ren? And that became the story. It was really a fascinating process, actually. And, and then the connection that she made with the other character, Dara, in the story um, was compelling in its own right. It didn't have anything to do with Jeannie and Sarah and that other thing I thought I was doing, but it was interesting. And you know, I hear from librarians that this book is checked out a lot. And I, I saw something on Goodreads the other day where a librarian was saying, you know, I just finally had to read it myself to see why these kids are always checking it out. Well, what is it about this book? And I think of all my books, this may be the one, this and Diamond Willow, I think, are the ones that kids like best. Just, you know, it's a compelling story, I think. So I'll read the first section of it. It's actually, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll read. It's, it's numbered a little, and, and this is in free verse. There's not an elaborate structure, but. So the first section is called um, The Way You Might Remember Your Best Friend. One, and this is Ren, um, that, that old girl's Ren. She's, it's her voice this time. I was a happy little girl wearing a pink dress, sitting in our gold minivan, dancing with my doll, Kamara. I'll be right back, Mom promised. Leave the music on, I begged, so she left her keys dangling while she ran in to pay for gas and buy a Diet Coke. Two, I think about that little girl, the way you might remember your best friend who moved away, sitting in the middle seat Beside an open window, her seatbelt fastened, she looked out at the world. Three, and then she heard a gunshot from inside the store. That's when she, when I, stopped breathing. I clicked my seatbelt off, dived into the back, and ducked down on the floor to hide under a blanket until Mom came back out. I heard the car door open, heard it close, the music stopped. Why? Mom liked that song. I breathed again. Mom smelled like cigarettes. I pushed the blanket off my face, opened my mouth to ask, what happened in there? But then I heard a word Mom wouldn't say, a man's voice. Come on, start. He was yelling at our car, and the car obeyed him. It started up just like it thought Mom was driving. Who was driving? Had this man just shot someone? Had he shot mom? If he found out I was back there, what would he do to me? I pulled the blanket back over my face. Pretend you're Kamara. Don't breathe, don't move. Be as small as you can, smaller. Sand on the floor of the car. I pressed hard, it stuck to my skin. I pressed harder. Breathe if you have to, but don't move a muscle. Like a small rabbit that knows a cat is close by, I paid attention. I didn't twitch. Five. I could tell which way we were headed. We stopped at the King Street stoplight. Left turn, right turn, left. He sped up. Was he trying to throw the police off our trail? He stopped, got out of the car. Where were we? He got back in, drove off faster. Sirens? Yes, coming closer. One time in first grade, a police officer came to our class. If someone tries to grab you, she said, wave your arms, kick your legs, yell at the top of your lungs, this man is not my father. The sirens meant someone might stop us. I could jump up, I could wave, I could yell, but it didn't happen. We drove faster, farther. The sirens faded away in the distance. Long, straight road, curvy road. Fast for a while, no stops, 
right turn, left turn, stop, go, turn. I swallowed the panic that rose. I didn't throw up. Six, sound of gravel, dust in my throat. Don't cough, bumping along that dusty road, screaming inside, Dad, where are you? Mom. A phone rang, Dad's ring on Mom's phone. Mom must have left her phone in the car. Her whole purse down on the floor. Do not, do not jump up and grab it. I clenched my hands together. GPS, the man snarled. I heard him dump Mom's purse upside down. He opened a window, he closed it. Did he just toss Mom's phone out the window? Seven, I put my thumb in my mouth like a little baby. I pulled my knees to my chin and closed my eyes tight. Where were we going? What would happen to me when we got there? After a long time, it felt like hours. The car slowed down. We made a sharp turn. We stopped. He got out. I heard a garage door open. He got back in the car. Forward. Stop. The garage door came open. Uh, excuse me. The garage door came down. The car door opened, slammed shut. I heard a dog barking or growling in the garage or outside. Another door opened and closed. Had the man gone somewhere? Carefully, I pushed back the blanket and looked around. I was alone in a very dark place. So I'll leave it there. I remember when I was writing that and I went to the bank one day in the middle of my writing day and I the, I don't know why <laughs> the bank clicks said something like, you know, how are you or something. And I said, I've just been scaring myself to death. <laughs> you know, she, it's, that was a, it was scary to write that. I mean, I really felt like I was in that situation with her and I couldn't rest until I got I was feeling it while you were reading that. So that's yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's scary. I mean, it's a scary situation. And that may be what is compelling to, about this book to kids, you know, that they wanted to see like what happens. And, I think it's more of a page turner than some of my other books, although each of them I, I like to think has a pretty fast paced plot. Which one you was could, that? That was Hidden. It's called Hidden, yeah. Does the library have all your books here? Do you know? I believe so. Well, they maybe about five or six. Not, yeah. not quite all. Yeah, but most of them. Yeah. Yes, and two yeah. more poetry books. Oh, cool. Your adult poetry yeah. books will be added. So. Mm -hmm. And the and the, they're all at Barnes and Noble table. I put also I put bookmarks out there, which I hope I, as I put them out on the Barnes and Noble table, I just meant them as a little gift for each of you. You know, it's a, the bookmarks have um, pictures of my books on them. There's one for YA books and one for younger readers, and then the Monarch and Milkweed is for younger children. But what I hope you won't do is to pick up my bookstore my bookmarks at Barnes and Noble and then go home and buy them on Amazon. <laughs> Try not, to, try not to do that. I, I, I like bookstores, so I hope to encourage that. Well, you said you would sign them if we bought them. I would be delighted to sign your books, yeah. So anyway, let's um, enjoy these amazing refreshments provided by the Friends of the Library. And I just really want to thank you for coming out. It's this cold and snowy night, and I appreciate your presence. And some of you have been to like all my presentations. It's been the coolest two days. It's really been fun to be here. So thank you so much. Yeah.